And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you, Pastor Ryan. And I don't know about you, but that was a much needed worship set. And for us uh, to come together and to sing, it is super important uh, when we come to church. We sing beforehand because we come in distracted and things going on in our lives and just to set aside time to sing and really to, to ring in the new year together. Happy New Year, by the way. You guys look amazing, honestly. I think you guys look great. Uh, for this, this is the group. Uh, the 9 o'clock had no idea this happened, but there was a game last night. Uh, this is the group that watched the game um, and had the heartbreak. Uh, really, last night I went to bed with confidence uh, with 10 minutes left in that game, and I woke up very, very sad and disappointed. But either way, we're at church, and we are thankful to have you. Uh, if I have not had the chance to meet you, my name is Mike. I serve as one of the pastors here. Please find me afterwards and introduce yourself. I would love to get to get the chance to meet you. Um, just to recap our Christmas Eve services, I want to thank you. Thank you tremendously uh, for those of you who served. A lot of you, I heard some people served all three services. Some of you served on Friday, came back on Saturday, or vice versa. Uh, that does not happen without all of you. And thank you for inviting. Um, there was just a ton, a ton of new faces. Uh, someone walked in the building on Christmas Eve and said to me, hey, I got dragged here, and it's cold. This better be good. Um, and I felt really confident at that moment that I was in trouble. But either way, uh, some people, they invited some 16 folks, and they all came. Uh, it was great. There was a guy who approached me. Uh, he's not a follower of Jesus, and he brought his friend, and he told me, hey, we're just planting seeds, bud. I brought my friend, and I was like, we're planting seeds with you, man. So either way, I want to thank you. There was a, a lady who'd been invited to church for over a year and a half, and she came Christmas Eve. So I want to thank you guys for that. It was truly a great time and celebration. As we jump into the new year, I thought it would be fitting for us to jump in a book of the Bible, uh, the book of Philippians. If you have that, you can grab your Bible and turn there. Uh, the chair in front of you, it's page 921. Uh, if you're new to this whole thing and uh, you have no idea what's going on, Philippians will be on the screen uh, and we'll walk through that with you. Um, but I want to start off with this question, um, who gets to decide when something is worth starting? Who gets to decide? And how do you decide? Uh, just raise your hand. How many of you, you are the New Year's resolution people? You like, you got goals, you got pay. Yeah, raise them up. I want to see how many friends I got in this room. Not many. Man, that's why you're at the 1030. You guys are like, my resolution is sleep in. Uh, whatever the case is. How many of you, just raise your hand. You're not. You don't want anything to do with them. Let me see. Yeah, some of you, you don't care. Your resolution is to not work out, eat more, and watch more TV. Whatever the case is. Uh, my wife hates the fact that I am a resolutions guy. I just like them. I don't know why. Uh, I like start, uh, the start of a season. I like to kick things off. It's exciting for me. Some of you, you could care less. You don't care anything about it. But here's the question I want you to ask is who gets to decide when something is worth starting? How do you decide when something is worth starting? Uh, as, a, as a couple, maybe you, you're married and you're like, hey, how did we, or how are we going to decide when to start a family? Um, we're going to start to decide, hey, this is what we should do. Or some of you, you didn't start to decide anything. You made a mistake by the lake and you got a kid and next thing you know, you know either way. Uh, some of you were like, can we joke like that in church? Yes, you can. You're allowed. Um, either way, how do you decide when you're going to start a new job, when you're going to start going to church, whatever the case is, if you're going to come 52 weeks out of the year, I think that'd be incredible. Uh, but either way, uh, I have 30, 36, 36 New Year's resolutions, not for myself, but for the church. Um, I don't know if that's a bad thing or a good thing, but we will find out. 36 things I'm praying and asking God that he would do in this next year through our church. And at the bottom of it, I just wrote Proverbs 19, 21. Many are the plans in the mind of a man, but the purpose of God will stand. And that's what I'm trusting in really for our church. And really, I believe when God starts something, you want to know what's true about him? He always sees it through. God has never started something that he didn't see through. You and I, um, we're very much half-hearted people. Um, we'll start things, we don't finish it out. New Year's resolutions probably don't make it to February or March for a lot of you. Maybe you thought you'd work out every day. By day three, you're like, I'm not waking up that early. I'm just not. Like, it's not a thing. Or uh, you try to maybe stop watching something or start something, whatever the case is. When God decides to start something, he always, always sees it through. He always has. That is a part of his character. He will see it through. And I think it's important for us as people to notice seasons that we're in. 
Because when you're in certain seasons of life or just in general, um, you'll start to have a, maybe a realization of, hey, maybe I should start doing this. Or maybe I should uh, stop doing this. Maybe I should read through the Bible in a year and make it past numbers or something. Like maybe uh, I'll try to hold my diet for you know, an extra week or whatever. But he- here's what's important about this time of year. It truly does feel like a fresh start because it is. And for us, we need to ask, why Why would we start something or why would we stop something? Um, and I want us to ask ourselves this question, how, how do you know or how does God work in our lives? How do you know? <clears throat> if I were to ask you, hey, how do you know God is working in your life? Some of you might say, hey, I just feel more of a sense of peace. I just feel this peace from God. Some of you might say, hey, I feel sensitivity to the Spirit. In moments, I just say yes to God. He puts an opportunity before me, and I feel that. For some of you, you would say, I'm actually, as we talked about, for the first time, I'd like to serve. I'd like to give back instead of just take. I want to feel the sense of growing and God working in my life. For some of us, this past year has been a journey, even a part of being at 539, and you would say, hey, for the first time, I have a heart for people far from God. That I don't just see them, but I actually feel burdened to reach them and pray for them and to invest in them. How do you know God is working in your life? You see, we're starting this book of Philippians. We're going to go through chapter and verse through the whole book. And the reason we're doing that is because there's some themes taught in the book that are important for us as a church really to pause to look at and say, hey, how does this affect my life and my obedience to God? And we've titled it Better Together. Because we'll see these themes that we're better together when we serve, we're better together when we're in community, we're better together when we forget the past and we walk forward, all these types of things, and we'll see today, we're better together for gospel advancement, that it's not a one-man show and that's never what God intended, that it takes a group of people that you and I are truly better together. In the book of Philippians, there's these three major themes that are taught. Uh, The first one is unity that you and I uh, would work well together, that not uniformity, but unity, that you can get along with other people really doing the same, having the same mindset and mission. The second thing is not just unity, but it's living on mission, that you would say, hey, my life is not my own, that my life is not just about me, but it's about God and living for him. Paul says this famous phrase, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain, that it would be living on mission. And last that it would be about joy, that you would have joy in unity and mission. Not that you just begrudgingly submit to God and hate everything about this. You're like, well, we were told to live on mission and be unified, so I guess we are. But you would have joy in what God is calling you to do. So how? How does God work in your life? There's times where you you, you know when he is. He's challenging you. He's stretching you. But today what we're going to do is look at these 18 verses and talk about how do we position ourselves How do you position yourself so that God can work in your life? It's a big uh, trend right now that, you know, years ago it was like, have all these goals. Now they're like, hey, have this rule of life or this system. Uh, You shouldn't try to wake up at 5 a.m. and work out every day. You should, like, try to get to bed at 9. Some of them crazy people going to bed at 9 9 p.m. But either way, um, how do you set yourself up so that God can work in your life? You see, the Apostle Paul is writing this letter, and we're going to work through uh, five things that I think he wants us to do so God can work in and through us. The first one we'll see, how God works in our lives, is with a specific community. There's a specific community and a specific group of people that God wants us to be a part of and with and for so that he can grow us and stretch us. Let's look at the first two verses in Philippians. It says this, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So this letter is coming from a guy named Paul. Um, Really, he is the one who is saying these things, and Timothy is probably writing these things down. He's saying, hey, we're servants of Christ Jesus to all the saints or believers or people who follow Jesus in Philippi. Uh, how many of you would know there's always a story behind the story? Uh, there's, in every marriage I've ever seen, there's always the person who will share a story, and then the other spouse will come and like clean it up. Well, actually, he's exaggerating or she's exaggerating. My wife will be like, well, let me tell you what really happened. I'm like, that's what happened. Um, but there's always a story behind the story. 
And really in Philippi, there's a story that's happening in Acts chapter 16. This is the first church that the Apostle Paul planted or started, took place in Europe. He goes and he starts this church in Macedonia, or the leading city is Philippi. And when he goes, all he did was start a prayer meeting. It says he goes by this river, he starts a prayer meeting, and when he does, there is a lady named Lydia who's a seller of purple goods. She's very wealthy. She comes to know Christ. And when she does, Paul, Timothy, Silas, these guys say, hey, let's just gather and pray all the time. So they would go, and they would go back to this place of prayer. And when they did, there's a a demon-possessed girl uh, that is following them and screaming shouts at them, just yelling at them like mad crazy. It says in the Bible, Paul is greatly annoyed. How many of you sometimes just get greatly annoyed? Yeah, your pastor sometimes gets greatly annoyed. So what's he do? He turns around and he casts the demon out of the woman. That's pretty crazy. Cast the demon out. Here's what then takes place. The townspeople find out. Throw him in prison. So he gets thrown in prison. He's like, hey, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to lead everyone in the jail to Christ. So they all become followers of Jesus. It's a crazy, crazy story. And this is what I want us to see from the story of Philippi, is every church plant has a story that God is writing with the people, and we're all in this one. That when he says to those of you who are at Philippi, it's not just a crowd, that he knows their names, he knows their stories, he knows their faces, that really when God decides to start a church, a body of believers, a gospel lighthouse per se, He does it with this in mind, that there are real lives, real people, and their lives are being changed. And if you're part of 539, you're a part of our story that God is writing. You're a part of this. You're with us. You're with what God is doing here. And really, it's important for us, would you go back to the passage? He says, with the overseers and deacons. And so, just for a brief moment, I thought it would be important for us to cover this at this time. Uh, 539 is a church plant meaning we were sent out from another church, a mother church, which was Maranatha Bible Church. When they send us out, what they do is they give us resources, they send people with us, and they say, hey, we're going to provide leadership for you. For a church to establish, to no longer be considered a church plant, there's three things that need to happen. Uh, The first thing is you need to have actual membership, at least for us. We won't call it membership. We'll call it something super trendy like partnership or something like that. But either way, uh, we'll, we'll have it. You, you'll see that coming up uh, in the next uh, pro- probably six to eight months. It could be around September, October. We'll, we'll have membership established here. Uh, second thing is this, overseers and deacons. All overseer means it's the same as pastor, elder, bishop, all of that stuff takes place. It's the same meaning of the word. And then deacons, which just, which just means servant. So overseers, notice how it's not just one. You don't want a one-man show. You don't just want one pastor. You want a plurality of leaders that would help take place and oversee the church. When Maranatha was sent out, um, we have what is is called at this point a board of transition, meaning Pastor Butch, uh, personally at Maranatha, Bruce Rosa, and Craig Peters and myself serve on the board. Meaning, uh, in the next three to five, maybe six years, we'll seek to establish a board or an elders uh, here at 539. We are in transition until that time takes place. The Bible says that you don't be quick to lay on hands, so we don't want to be quick to lay on hands. Lastly, the third thing, which is actually a praise of what God is doing, is financial stability. When Maranatha would send out a church plant, um, they would provide up to three years of support. Um, we have finished our uh, first 16 weeks as a church. We're not even walking yet. And uh, we, they looked at things and where we were financially. And it's starting in 2023, we are on our own financially as a church with no external support. Um, yeah, you can praise God for that. That's because of your giving and everything that God is doing as a church. We have zero debt. Um, everything that you guys give goes towards outreach and missions and the building and the staff. It, it's really incredible of what God is doing. So really the last two things is membership and then leadership in the next couple years. And then he goes on to say this, grace and peace from God. Grace to you. He always starts his letters this way because the two things you receive from God right when you become a follower of Jesus is grace and then peace. He always starts on that way. And then what does he say? Servants of Christ Jesus. He titles himself or themselves, hey, we are servants of God. We don't serve man. We're here to serve Jesus. So the question I would like us to ask is this. 
Is servant of Jesus the title I place over my life? Is it a title that you will or could place over your life? You see, because a lot of people are fine being called servant, as one pastor said, until someone actually treats you like one. Until someone actually treats you like one, then you're kind of like, hey, I know what I'm doing. I got this. But they say, hey, we're servants of Christ Jesus. The reason we say God will work in your life with a specific community is because when you have the right church, you have the right mission, we'll talk in a second, you have leadership, you're with them, there's a specific group that you would say, hey, this is who I want to walk with and do life with. Number two, God works in our lives with gospel partners, with gospel partners. It says in verses three to six, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel. From the first day until now, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. So would you go back to the previous verses, three to five? This is important because you get this idea of, hey, there is partnership, um, really, that they're working together, and Paul feels a certain way about them. Um, He knows them, and the reason it's kind of weird is you want to ask, hey, Paul, why are you so affectionate towards these people? What if, you know... What's been going on? Why do you feel so deep, uh, deeply connected to them? Because there's three things, three things. When you have a church family, there's three things that need to take place. You need to have consistency in community. You need to have this regular working together. You need to have what we'll see, partnership in the gospel. You need to have alignment and mission. And you need to have longevity. Or we'll, we'll say it this way. Church will start to feel like a family when there is consistency in community and alignment and mission. We say this all the time, that church is meant to be a family, that if you're here, family is available for you. But here's how church works. There is this pendulum that kind of swings or this balance beam you ride, that there are some folks, some of you, your life is just up in flames, that crap has just hit the fan. Are we allowed to say crap? I don't know. Someone just looked at me, but we're in Mogador, kind of Goodyear Heights. Crap hits the fan, and you don't know what you're going to do. You don't know what you're going to do. So you need a family to belong to. You need consistency, those who can care for you. Then there's other times, it's sunshine and rainbows. I mean, you got the right, I mean, 2022 was your best year yet. 2023, going to be even better. At that time, you carry burdens. And sometimes you need someone to carry your burdens. And what you need is consistency and community. Does not mean you're at church 52 weeks out of the year. I think that would be great. Obviously, I think you should, but I know that's probably not going to happen. I think you should be a part of a community every week. Don't miss. I think you will miss. That's okay. I think you should serve. I think you should be at every outreach event. That's not going to happen. I get that. Here's the reality. Consistency. Because the moment when you need a family is the moment that you want to say, have I been family to others? Who are the people that I want to walk with, that I've tried to be there for, that can be there for me? Because there will come times in your life, seasons, where you will need extra help. And in order for the church to be the family, you need to have consistent community and then alignment and mission, meaning this. Hey, we agree and we understand with what is taking place. We want to reach people far from God. We want to invite friends into family. We agree with that, that we are partners in the gospel. You see, this is how I think growth happens. And then go back to verse 6. And this is a very famous verse. If you underline in your Bible, if you star it, if you emoji it, if you color it, if you whatever, tattoo it, whatever, don't get a tattoo. Uh, maybe you can't, I don't care. Either way, uh, he, who, he who began a good work in you, he who started it, will bring it to completion. That mean, meaning this, when God starts something in your life, he will see it through. Meaning he's not done with you, he's not frustrated with you. Here's how the Christian life works. You and I, we become followers of Jesus. Once you do, hopefully you get baptized. Take a step forward. That's one step. Then maybe you join a community, a Bible study. You start hanging out with other believers. You take another step forward. You're doing great. You're feeling really awesome. Maybe you've said no to some serious strongholds in your life, and you're working in the right direction. Then guess what happens? You mess up. You fall back in. You get messed up, you, you stu- someone hurts you, and then you take another step back. Here's what happens in the Christian life. You and I are all a work in progress. You're constantly taking one step forward, two steps back. 
Two steps forward, three steps back. And here's what you need to know. God, the, the work he started in you, he's not done. He's not done. Guess when it's done? At the day of Christ Jesus, meaning when you go to heaven, meaning he's not finished. All of us, all of us, we're just a piece of work. Someone uh, approaches you next week and says, you're just a piece of work. You got that? My Bible says I am. I don't know. Uh, you, we, just, we just are. This is super, super important. God is not frustrated with the work in progress you and I are. The step you're taking forward. I've shared this before. Uh, when my daughter, uh, she's three now, when she started to walk, uh, just like a normal parent, I mean, she walked before any other kid, like, in the world. Um, it, she was 11 months. I mean, seriously. I got a video. Some of you were in this room were there. Video of her walking in my basement. And I'm sitting there yelling. I'm like, this is huge. You know how many kids walk? All of them. And I'm like, this is amazing. All of them. But you want to know why? Because it's my daughter. It's my daughter. I think it's incredible. I think she's tearing it up. Now, this is a, a picture or an illustration of what I think how God looks at you. My, my daughter didn't fall, and I'm like, stand up. We walk at the Duma house. No, that, that's, that's not what happened. That would be cruel and mean, right? I don't know what's happening. I'm feeling really excited today about New Year's. Um, but he, here's, here's what happens. She falls. What do we do? We pick her up. We help her. Hey, one more step. Hey, come on. Just follow me. Come on, one more. And that's all God does with us. When you fall, when you mess up, and you need a new year, and you need a fresh start, Something God started in you, he will see it through. And the problem you and I have is this. It takes too long. I thought I'd be done with this by now. I thought I wouldn't say this anymore. I thought I wouldn't feel this way anymore. When am I never going to be anxious again? At the day of Christ Jesus. When am I never going to have anger just boiling inside of me? At the day of Christ Jesus. When am I going to stop feeling this way or doing? At the day of Christ Jesus. But something God started in you, he will see it through. Amen? Let's move on to uh, number three. How God works in our life is when our love deepens. Our love deepens. Um, this is a little bit longer of a section, verses 7 to 11. I'm going to read it all, and then we'll talk. <clears throat> he says this, It is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart. For you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So let's talk about this idea of when our love deepens. I'll be honest, it's a little strange. He's saying, I yearn for you with the affection of Christ Jesus. God is my witness. Why? Why would he feel so strong about them? It's the same essence of having someone, like think about it. The, the lady Lydia that he's led to Christ and baptized, that's who's in his mind. He longs for them, that they would what? That their love would abound more and more. Think of uh, the jail. There's a jailer he leads to Christ in Acts 16. He probably sees them in his mind. He's like, hey, I long for you, not that you would just grow in knowledge, but that your love would abound more and more. You see, he feels this way, and this is true for us, that this love that we're trying to have, our love deepens. It takes a group project. Go back to the previous slide. He's saying, you are all partakers of grace with me, that this grace that we have, this is, this is all of us working together, that your love would abound more and more. And here's what, is, what happens for most of us as followers of Christ. After you become a follower of Jesus, you start to learn some stuff, which is very, very good. You know uh, chapter and verse. You can say John 3.16 in like three or four different translations. Uh, you can give me the NIV, the KJV, whatever. Uh, you, you start to learn some things. You're in a Bible study. You can say the big number and the little number. Uh, you knew Philippians started with a PH and not an F. Uh, you, 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 you just, you know, you never thought about that. Uh, some of you are like, didn't know. Um, you, you start to learn some stuff. And once the knowledge happens, then if we're not careful, our hearts or our love can grow cold. You see, the greatest commandment is what? <clears throat> that we should love God with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, and all of our strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. We often want to graduate from that. We want something special. We want something unique. We want something different. We want something personal. And he said, hey, here's my prayer. 
that your love would abound more and more. Why? He says down later on in verse, verse 10, so that you may approve what is excellent. Not that you would be perfect, not that you would have it all together, not that you're like the, the picture perfect idea follower of Christ. No, that you would just approve what is excellent. And what is excellent? That your love abounds more and more. That you and I in 2023 hopefully are more loving of a person. And we'll say it this way. Spirituality is measured with the depth of our love from the knowledge we have and it cannot, cannot be measured in isolation. So spirituality, growing closer to God, becoming more like Jesus, doesn't happen on our own. Um, Proverbs, one of my favorite Proverbs, 18.1 says, Whoever isolates himself, pulls away, breaks out against all sound judgment. Which, in reality, this is the very thing we would like to do when things are going bad. When life is stressful. We want to isolate and the Proverbs say, hey, the more you do that, the harder, you're actually, the harder it is to discern what the right decision is. It can't be measured in isolation. Spirituality is, hey, the love that I have for others is growing and becoming more mature. And you can't gauge someone's love for others when they're not connected. You don't really know God's working in your life until someone really just annoys the mess out of you. Until you actually have to forgive until you actually have to like be kind and patient. Until you actually have to do that and then you're like, hey, years ago I would just probably cut them off and not talk to them. Now, I want my love to grow more and more. This is how he feels for them. And number four, how God works in our lives is when our goals change. You see, this is important. This is important because, um, how, real quick, how many of you, um, you would say in the last five years your goals have changed? Raise your hand, last five years. Okay, how many of you, uh, if ten, 10 years, 10 years, just totally different. Raise your hand. Yeah, yeah, you're like, yeah, I get it. Um, here's what I would say. Um, the Apostle Paul, his goals and his perspective and his aim changes drastically. He went from a guy um, in the Bible. He was killing Christians, okay? Uh, yeah, that's his nine to five, okay? You, you, you clock, I don't think they clocked it. He clocked in, he went over, he found Christians, throw them in prison, try to get them killed, all this type of stuff. Then he switches. Something crazy happens. Guess what happens? He meets Jesus. Amen. Jesus drastically changes his life. Now he's in prison. Kind of flip the switch. And, and you and I, over the past five to ten years, if I were to ask you, tell me what's changed the most about your goals or your ambitions, what would you say? Um, I, I asked permission to share this after the, after the first service, but I did, and I was like, hey, should I ask my wife? Uh, if you would asked me 12 years ago, what are your goals? I would have said, hey, I want to make, like, a, a ton of money. Like, I want a lot. Like, I don't ever want to think about how much money I have. I want that much. Multiple cars, multiple. Don't look at me like that. I mean, this is before Christ. You guys are like, oh. Uh, I, I, wanted, I wanted to drink whenever I wanted. I wanted no stipula. I mean, that is something I remember thinking in my head when I was, like, 17. And I wanted, like, a lot of, a lot of girls. That was like a thing. Don't look at me again. Ask permission before Christ. Before Christ. 12 years ago, I was like, hey, I got three things I want. Money, I want. I want to drink. I want to have my life. And then I want, I want a lot of girls. That was it. I was 17. And guess what God did? He said, hey, I don't like that plan. And then I met Jesus. You know what's changed? Everything. Everything. Because our goals change. Your perspective changes over the years. And we get this perspective from Paul we see in verse 12 to 14. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. He's in prison. Does he have the right to complain? Yeah. Does he have the right to, to get upset at God? Yeah. Does he have the, I mean, we, we, you would think, some of us, like, we have, we have little things happen in life, and we're just like, I mean, why me, God? Really? It, it, he's in prison, and he says, hey, Relax. What's happening to me? Guess what's happening? Other people are finding Christ. It served to advance the gospel. He says this, So that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. Most of the brothers have become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment are much more bold to speak the word without fear. We are better together. So they're hearing the story of Paul, hearing of his boldness, and they're like, hey, we probably shouldn't hesitate in sharing Jesus because like, Paul's kind of doing it, and he's not in a good situation. I think we can kick hesitation out the door. 
I think we can share. I think we can say, I mean, he, he's looking at his goals and they're totally changing. So here's what I think. I think you and I should write over our goals for 2023. That whatever happens in 2023, may my life be used to advance the name of Jesus. You just write that over anything. I don't care what's in your goals. I don't care what you have for resolutions. Uh, you just write over that, hey, whatever happens, whatever happens. I don't know everything that's going to happen. I don't know when. I don't know what it's going to look like. I don't know who's going to come in contact with me. I don't know who the family, I don't know who we're going to lose or the grief. I don't know anything, but here's what needs to happen. Would my life be used to advance the name of Jesus? Because you and I, um, this book will pull us in. You have one life. And the more you give your life away to God is the more fulfilling life that he offers. The more you give it to him and say, hey, this isn't mine. 2023, it's not mine. It's his. And we can also say it this way. We cannot decide what happens to us, but we can decide who will get the attention because of it. So he has something happen to him externally. And when you and I have things happen in life, isn't it easy to pull the focus and attention to us? Let's talk about ourselves. We'll just post about ourselves. We'll just tell them a longer story about ourselves. We'll just, we'll make it about ourselves. We can say, hey, you know what? I'm not really good at sharing Jesus. I'm not good at giving him attention. But when someone asks me, I'm just going to say, yeah, I don't, I don't know what's going on in my life, but Jesus is helping me a ton, trying to give it to him. I didn't anticipate this happening, but you want to know what? I'm going to give it to Jesus. He's, he's going to help me. I, I'm, I'm, I'm praying about it and asking God to help. He's been really good. Because serving Jesus when you're suffering speaks something. It speaks something. Really, when you're serving Jesus in general, trust me, w people already think you're crazy. They do. I, I know. I mean, they think I'm nuts. Like, just totally, I've lost my mind. I'm like, yeah, kind of. Uh, I don't know what to tell you. But when you're suffering, and it, it speaks something to the outside world of those saying, hey, that doesn't make sense. What is that that you have? I'm giving it to God. I've, this is being used to advance the name of Jesus, not my life. And lastly, number five, and I'll do it pretty quick because of time, is we start to see the real win. Um, I think God will work in our lives with these five things, and this last one could be the most important for us as, as a church at this time. Uh, because church can get really weird, really fast, uh, if we're not careful, of why we're doing what we're doing and what the real win is. So let's look at verse 15 to 18. It says this, Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. Saying that's why he's here. He's come for one reason. It's to defend that Jesus alone saves. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Here is the win. The win is not if we win or there's any group that wins. The win is that we witness and Christ is proclaimed. Amen. It gets weird super fast when it's about a name, it's about a brand, it's about a specific movement. It's about anyone else besides Christ. So you don't get all worked up if someone comes to know Christ and goes somewhere else. I think that's a huge win. If it's a Bible-preaching, gospel-preaching church, a win for God is a win for us. It doesn't, he said, hey, there, there's some people, they're, they're in this for the wrong reasons. And, and this happened twice, twice with Jesus and his followers. One time. They show up to Jesus, and they're kind of serving God a lot at this time. And they said, hey, Jesus, Peter and John are like, who gets to sit at your right and your left? Jesus is like, we're kind of on a missions trip right now. Like, we're, we're, we're doing VBS, man. I don't know. What, not VBS. Uh, right? They're, they're kind of serving God. He's saying, hey, you, you, need to, you need to let this to rest. The other time, the disciples, again, they go running up to Jesus, and they're like, hey, did you hear that other people are casting out demons in your name, but they don't follow our group. You know what Jesus says? Hey, the one who's not against us is for us. Whoever gives out a cold drink of water in my name is fit for the kingdom of God. Here's what you need to remember. That there is that the only competitive mindset as a church that we have is for those who are far from God. That's it. That, that's the only thing. That's the win. The win is when the gospel is proclaimed. That it's only and always about Jesus. 
I'd like to end just looking at this verse, Philippians 1, 6. It says, I am sure of this. I'm confident. You can put all your chips in. That he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. Here's what is important for us to know on twofold. So the first group I want to talk to you is this. Some of you, you're just so tired. You're just exhausted. You feel like God's given up on you. You feel like you've tried to change. You've tried to get better. You've taken multiple steps back in your life, and you're just exhausted. I want to remind you today that God, what he starts, he has never not finished. It's outside of his character. If God has started a work in your life, you keep pressing in, you find people to help, you keep walking with Jesus in the right direction, he will finish what he started in you. The second group of you, some of you, he's never started a work in you. You're sitting here today and you've been hitting your head up against the wall spiritually. You've been trying to do the work. You've been trying to be a better person. You've been trying to come to church enough. You've been trying to serve and you've never trusted in the work of God. Jesus says this, this is the work of God. This is all you need to trust in, that you believe in Jesus whom God has sent. The only work is by grace through faith, which is no work in and of itself, that you would trust his finished work. Would you guys stand and I'll pray for us this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for 2023. We get to start this year off together and strong as a church, focusing on you and your word I pray that as a group, we would be better together for gospel advancement. I pray that we would, you you would use our lives in this church to reach people far from you. God, for those who are just tired and weary this morning, I pray that they would give their burdens to you. That 2023 would be the year that they trust you more deeply and have confidence that you will carry them and you will finish. And for those in this room, they've never received you. They've never put their faith and trust in the finished work. You can do that right now where you're standing. The Bible says you would just confess. Say, God, I'm a a sinner. I've made mistakes. I've sinned against you. I've never trusted in Jesus dying on the cross and rising from the dead for my salvation. I've trusted in other things. I've trusted in what I can do, but not your work. Would you just, if that's you, you could pray that right now. You just cry out to God and ask him to save you. The Bible says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. If you're making that decision today for the first time, will you just raise your hand real quick? I want to pray with you and for you. If you're making that, just throw your hand up for me. Awesome. Lord, we thank you for those who have made the decision to follow you today. God, I pray that you would help them to walk with you and that your spirit would give them peace. And as we receive grace, Jesus, we do love you as we get to sing that out to you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.